now we need to make sure the body can get rid of that senescent cell. And it's when it doesn't get rid of it that aging starts to speed up. So what yes. is that correct? And what can we do to yes. speed up the exiting of the zombie cells? Yeah. So so enter senolytics. And this is really where the all the buzz is right now in terms of biotech, farm, dietary supplement. Um, this idea of a, what is a senolytic. So a senolytic is any substance that destroys a senescent cell in the body. And there's various compounds. There are drugs that do it, and there are natural compounds. There are compounds found in our diet. There are compounds found in botanicals. But we're learning more and more about what is potentially a senolytic substance. And hmm. this whole area just blew up in 2015. Um, there was no. one study that came out by the, the Scripps Institute and the Mayo Clinic that showed that a, a simple combination of desatinib and quercetin um, had very powerful senolytic effects. And this was the first time the researchers from that study actually coined the term senolytic to really describe this new found compound. And they found that by giving these compounds to mice, um, it did two things. It decreased the senescent cell burden within those mice, and it provided really um, amazing functional benefits, which again is the most important thing, right? You need to have right. some broad outcome and positive benefit or else why are you doing it? Yeah. Um, and they saw that that it improved frailty, it improved bone health, it improved cardiac function, uh, it improved the health span of these mice, it improved the lifespan. Um, and so these researchers were, were super excited. And so this was really, I would say, revolutionary in the field of anti-aging. Um, it was the first time that this idea was really validated. And so from this, I think this this really opened the, the, the door to more research into senolytics. And um, it's just been fascinating ever since. So a senolytic compound has the ability to destroy the zombie cell. It's a We're looking at it like a noun, not a verb. I, th I think it's both. Um, yeah, it so could be. It could yeah, be. Yeah, I think it's both. I so so yes, they they destroy it, but how they destroy it is important. Yes. These uh, these substances go in and they interfere with certain pro survival pathways that these senescent cells have upregulated over time, and it's only these lingering senescent cells that upregulate these certain proteins. Right. Um, and so these senescent cells are very. Uh, I'm sorry. These senolytics are very selective about what cells are being impacted by this function, so they don't impact healthy cells. Uh, they don't impact any tissues in the body. So they're incredibly safe because they're targeting senescent cells and they're disrupting this one pathway that um, is preventing that senescent cell from moving into apoptosis. And so by disrupting those proteins, the cell then is able to move into apoptosis, self-destruct, and basically get its parts get, get recycled by all of the other neighboring cells. A stem cell, a youthful stem cell moves in and you get more youthful function of that tissue because it's being replaced by this brand new stem cell. Are there certain foods we can eat that have this senolytic capability? to it? Well, so we so we know quercetin, right? Quercetin is um, found everywhere in the diet. The, one of the best sources is in yellow onions. It is that yes. yellow flavonoid compound. However, there was a study in 2018 that looked at a panel of flavonoids. So they were testing the senolytic activity of these different flavonoids and trying to figure out which ones were the most powerful. And of course, they looked at quercetin. They looked at curcumin from turmeric. They looked at luteolin. They looked at uh, EGCG from green tea. But they also looked at this compound called fisetin. Um, and fisetin is endlessly fascinating. Um, it's worth a Google. Um, check it out. But this study basically identified fisetin as the most powerful senolytic substance uh, that, that, that we know of. And fisetin is found in the diet. You know, we do yeah. know that we consume about 0.4 milligrams of fisetin on a daily basis. Um, you know, fisetin is a yellow flavonoid. It comes from strawberries, apples, grapes, cucumbers. A lot of fruits and vegetables have this yellow pigmented flavonoid. But the, the issue is that you're not getting the right amount. So yeah. 0.4 milligrams per day is a very small amount. And the studies now um, on fisetin are using a much bigger dose. They found that you need 20 milligrams per kilogram of body weight in order to get uh. that, that big senolytic effect. And so that equates to about 1,400 milligrams of pure fisetin in order to have that effect. 
So, yeah. so yes, you can get it from the diet for sure. Then I, my brain goes to, well, then we still have the two major obstacles when it comes to getting nutrients from food. One is what soil was it was it grown in? And two, what kind of gut dysbiosis do you have? And if those two things are off, you could eat all the re- yellow onions in the world and you're still not going to get enough of that of that compound. You're spot on. Yes. And yeah. and we know that that our oil uh, our, our soil is deficient in a lot of minerals yeah. and compounds that really help to drive the nutrient compound of the foods that we're eating. Um and and most people are dysbiotic. Um, they have some disruption in their microbiome and flavonoids by and large are hard to absorb. They have low bioavailability. They generally don't get into the bloodstream very readily unless you have the ability to break them down, ferment them in the GI tract. And so your microbiome is critically important here. It's 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 part of the equation yeah. uh, in terms of how we use these compounds. And if you don't have the right bacteria, you're not using these compounds in the right way. And that's where... That, that, that's where the whole thing starts to unravel because <laughs> when you look at what destroys the microbiome, you start to go, oh my gosh, all of us have some form of gut dysbiosis if we're living in this modern world, um, which is why, again, I'm back at it, building a fasting lifestyle. And then when you add food back in, you're adding the fermented foods, you're adding the prebiotic, probiotic rich foods so that you can keep supporting those bacteria because the minute you eat out, you're starting to get some destruction of that bacteria. So it's really sad. I agree. I, and fasting is a great reset because it gives you a moment yeah. to rethink all of your habits and definitely your daily input to make sure that you're optimizing the microbiome. And you can shift the microbiome drastically in a very short amount of time. And studies show that it takes generally about three days to have significant shifts in the microbiome. And so fasting alone pushes reset. You know, you increase the uh, migrating motor complex which helps the body just flush some of the bacteria and food and kind of, you know, it's a drastic reset, which is great. But then what you put in next is critically important. You need to make sure that you're getting a very diverse, well-rounded diet because you're you're feeding those bacteria. And if you're not feeding the bacteria what they want, those bacteria don't thrive and then they go extinct. And so we know that hunter and gatherers have, you know, roughly 700, 800 different strains of bacteria in their gut. And living in California, we have about 200 strains. And so we're missing a large part of our microbiome that we've evolved Mm -hmm. with over time just through living in the modern world. Um, And so it's important to create diversity through a diverse diet.